Good afternoon. You see Master Gardeners of San Mateo and San Francisco counties welcome you to our first spring garden edible series, Planning a Year Round Garden. Our presenters today are Carol O'Donnell and Jonathan Propp. Carol has been a Master Gardener since 2006. Her current focus is working and teaching at the Garden Education Center, uh, the demonstration garden located at the San Mateo Event Center. Jonathan has been a UC Master Gardener since 2008, and he lectures frequently on growing organic fruits and vegetables in the home garden. During this presentation, you have the opportunity to type in any questions you may have, and I think that you might have quite a few questions. At the end of the presentation, our chat monitors will compile and select questions for our presenters to answer. If your question is not answered, you can type in your questions on our MG helpline. A copy of the presentation and the video will be found on our UCMG website. And now let me present our, our wonderful gardeners, Carol and Jonathan. Good afternoon. I'm thrilled mm -hmm. to present the year round edible garden to such a large number of participants. This is the subjects that I will cover today. A close look at the planting calendar the year-round gardening concept, and vegetable bed preparations. Then Jonathan Propp will present season extending techniques and irrigation if time permits. I'm gonna start with a discussion of our planting calendars. San Mateo County and San Francisco counties have diverse weather patterns so we have three calendars. The first one we're looking at right now is the planting calendar for sunny areas of San Francisco and Northern San Mateo counties. So that includes the Mission District of San Francisco and other sunny areas, plus San, the city of San Mateo and Foster City. The next calendar, and proceed to the next calendar, is for the hot areas of San Mateo County. Hot areas are, uh, extend from San Carlos and Belmont down through the county line, and they actually go into San Jose. So if you're over the line, you can use this calendar for San Jose as well. And then our third um, planting calendar is for the foggy areas of San Francisco and we all know where that is, out at the beach uh, in San Francisco and extends down coastal San Mateo counties. Let's look carefully at, we'll use the foggy calendar. Um, and uh, back to the foggy calendar, this one before that, there we go. Um, notice that the, um, each of the calendars have on the top line indicate that our year is divided into five planting seasons, early spring, spring, summer, fall, and winter. Under each uh, season are months. So early spring includes January, February, and March. In March, for instance, you look at the vegetables below, and those are the vegetables you can plant into your garden during March. Because we have a lot of microclimates in our area. So while you may be in the foggy area, it doesn't apply uniformly. So be prepared to experiment in your garden. These are guides, not rules, and perhaps keep a journal so that you know what your garden will produce. No, uh, look at the bottom, lower left of each calendar, and there's a legend explaining that S next to a vegetable means that you can seed into that, seed that vegetable into that in your garden during that month. T means transplant, a pound sign means you can plant that vegetable during weeks one and two, 
and a star means you can plant that vegetable during weeks three and four. Let's do an example. Look at um, April and you, under bean, right at the top, the uh, bean runner or bean snap, and it has an S after it. That indicates that you can see directly into the garden during that month. Um, be aware that this calendar doesn't warn you that you need to start your own seedlings. Um, I should say transplants. So you can look ahead and plan to produce your own seedlings, six packs, and it usually takes at least uh, five weeks, six weeks, or you can purchase them from your local nursery. Let's look next at the um, year round edible garden planting sequence chart. As you notice at the top, it looks much like your um, calendar of um, planting calendar. And there's five seasons, early spring, spring, summer, fall, and winter. Under that, going back to January, then you see the months of the year. This is this uh, is like your planting calendar. So it's used in conjunction with your planting calendar. This chart has three banners, the top one, early spring, spring, summer, etc. The second banner, focus on the second banner, that's the green box for early spring. I've divided, uh, I've, I'm explaining the year round edible garden in a two bed format. You may have more than two beds. You may have five beds, but follow along so you can understand how to plant your garden um, in this manner. So early spring, that bed, bed one, will, will be planted in January, February, and March, and you can harvest in April and May. Now look at the third banner down. The first box is orange and it's going to be your spring bed. This is bed two and you will be planting bed two in April and May and harvesting, pardon me, in June and July. Next, um, well, let's go on to the next slide and see how this works. And I understand you've downloaded this, um, this sheet. So follow along and you can refer to your copy during the year to help you produce this wonderful year round garden. So we're going to look at uh, the chart at the top and there is an explanation below. So for instance, uh, put your marker on early spring the second banner down, and this is bed one. And the explanation down below is also in green, early spring, January and February and March in bed one, you're going to plant all the wonderful cool season vegetables, peas, uh, lettuces, carrots. Now go to banner three, and look at spring. So in spring, April and May, all your warm season crops, and we all look forward to planting tomatoes, but these are, these tomatoes are uh, long producing and beans and corn. So they are going to be in your garden maybe for six months, almost six months. So plant them to one side of your spring bed because you want to leave room for putting in your cool season crops. Again, you want more carrots, you want more peas maybe, Swiss chard, all the green vegetables, maybe the wonderful Asian greens. And then and you're, while you're planting your spring bed, you're eating out of your early spring bed. 
So that by month, June, the early spring bed is empty, nothing to eat. So we are going to transition bed one into your summer bed. Look below at the explanation and your June and July choices from your calendar replace your early spring crops. And these crops, remember, I think you probably understand now that these will produce in August and September. Now what? Let's look down below at the next page. And here we have the second part of the chart. We had to split it. Um, and so, whoops, no, go to the second one. That's it. Um, so now we've finished planting um, uh, the spring bed. And so we're going to, again, go to bed two and replant bed two to the fall crops. Remember, your tomatoes are to one side, I hope. <laughs> and you've left room for planting, replanting all those cool season crops. You want to have something to brag about in, for Thanksgiving and Christmas. This is the time, believe me, in fall, it's hot. Believe me, you will, it'll get cold someday. <laughs> Uh, it seems counterintuitive to be planting cool season crops at the height of our warm season. But if you want to eat it on Thanksgiving and Christmas, you're going to have to plant it in the heat of summer. So next, let's look at our winter crop. And then bed one, the third, this is the third time you've replanted this bed this year. Um, so you're going to be planting in um, October, November, and December. With October being the most important um, time to plant this bed, try to get your as many vegetables in as you can at the beginning of, of October. You want those plants to grow to juvenile size quickly. Broccoli, lettuce, well, peas will continue growing anyway. <laughs> the spinach, all these crops need to be in uh, and growing pretty well by November 21st. On November 21st, at our latitude, our daylight hours fall below 10 hours. That means that these crops will just vegetate. They'll sit there like they do in your refrigerator, but they're in the ground, but they'll sit there and wait for you to harvest them. Um, so you're going to be harvesting them in January, February, and March. Now, let's look again at banner three and um, bed one and now it's the beginning of the new year. Notice that dark vertical line that separates this year from next year. And this bed is in the, um, the bed two will now become your early spring bed. And the year starts again. Plant, grow, and eat. Uh, let me see. By now, you're probably wondering, um, will this work? So let's look down below, down at the next chart. And um, so, go, yes, there it is. Look at all those beautiful vegetables. These, uh, at the lower right-hand corner of this slide, you'll see what we picked on January 22nd, uh, out of our um, demonstration garden at the San Mateo County Event Center. 
Notice that these, these are picked out of two four by eight foot beds. That's, that's only, that's not much square feet, but look at how much you can get out of the, that bed. The sugar snap peas have been wonderful. They've been producing for two months and the Swiss chard. And we have uh, in the lower left of that picture, we have red beets and white beets. And up above, those are three heads of beautiful red uh, butterhead lettuces. They've just been, that's, that variety is called Carmona. I love it. It is sweet. It produces well. All these vegetables taste better in winter. And then here's Swiss chard and bok choy. And down, those are um, um, King Midas carrots. And they just, they just grew. It, they took quite a while to grow to, to size. They on, they're only six inches long, um, but they wait in the garden. One thing you have to remember, all of these um, winter uh, root vegetables need to be picked by um, January or 21st or soon after because they have been vernalized. They've gone through winter, they're biennials, and now they're going to rush to seed. So if you wait too long admiring them like I tend to do, uh, then it'll suddenly go to the seed and um, you won't have any vegetables. Anyway, um, let's see, have I missed anything? No, let's go on now to bed preparation. This is the, um, oh, that's me in my weedy garden. <laughs> uh, I, I've spent too much time making um, sourdough bread and I let my home garden go. So here I am a couple of weeks ago weeding my bed. And when I prepare my vegetable beds, um, I, there are, I generally cut my vegetables off at ground level. So when I harvest them, well, when I, I'm preparing the bed, I dig up the root and I look at it. And I look at the surrounding soil and see why your plant, try to understand why your plant thrived or failed. And if you see uh, uh, little bugs on there or uh, discoloration, go to University of California Integrated Pest Management, UCIPM, uh, and find, try to find out what's the matter with that vegetable. If you can't, then contact Master Partners take a picture of it and send it to us. Um, if it looks okay, well, you're digging it up, put it in the compost pile. So now let's see. And then after I weed my bed, <laughs> let's go, yes, here it is. Before I start working the soil, I'm going to pick up a handful of soil, you know, make a little clump, open your hand, if it's too wet, it's all stuck together and it doesn't fall apart. So it's too wet. Don't work your soil when it's too wet. Or if you take a handful and you open your hand and it's like falls apart, it's too dry. Don't do it then either. On the right, there's my hand. I've clenched my fist and I opened it and I touched it with my thumb and it fell apart. So this is just right, <laughs> like the three little bears. Um, let's go on now. Um, here's, here are the tools that I use for, for my vegetable bed. I use um, the broad fork, the digging fork, a bow rake, and a three-pronged cultivator. And here's how I do it. Um, first of all, uh, you see me standing on a board. I never step on my beds. I don't want the soil I, I so carefully aerated and softened uh, to be compacted. So 
distribute your weight out in that manner or work from the side of the bed. Um, so you put the broad fork in, step on it. It goes in about 10 and a half inches and then rock it back. And you see how the soil cracks. Um, you don't turn, I don't turn, I turn the soil over because it, um, it's bad for the bugs <laughs> and um, it's bad for your soil structure. So you want to air your beds, but you don't want to um, turn it over. Um, so then next I, oh, I, I do use my three prong cultivator to break up large clots and to smooth it out. And then I apply about three to six cups of alfalfa meal for um, uh, slow release nitrogen. And this is a 50 square foot bed. And I am putting, I want half an inch of compost in, in the bed. So that's for 50 square feet, that's three buckets of, three of those five gallon buckets um, that you get, can get any place. <laughs> um, and so distribute it and then um, and then next I, I take my digging fork and I put it in at an angle and sift the alfalfa meal and compost into the top three inches of soil. Um, I rake the bed into a pretty fine seat. No, go back. <laughs> I rake, I have a lot to say here. <laughs> uh, I rake the bed into a fairly fine seed bed. Um, and then I bring the uh, bed up to what's called field capacity. Field capacity means um, you've put a, a, enough soil on, I mean enough water on to saturate the soil. And I do it down 12 inches. So you can check with your shovel to see that you have wet the soil down 12 inches. Don't do this in a hurry. You don't want your soil to puddle uh, and flood or run off. So throughout the day, when you finish, when you're ready to moisten your soil, do it slowly. Turn on your drip irrigation um, and then turn it off and use your hose and do it intermittently throughout the day until you get a nice, nice field uh, saturation to your soil. And then wait a day or two. You don't want to put your plants in to a sopping wet bed, um, they'll drown. <laughs> um, let's see. So next, what happens next? There's the bed planted. <laughs> um, and the drip irrigation all laid down. So now um, I'm going to cover bed preparation. Oh, I'm sorry, I finished bed preparation. May the green man bless our gardens. Thank you. And now Jonathan is going to speak to, um, to you about his, about your um, vegetable, no, wait a minute. Veggie crops and greenhouses. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Carol. I just want to say that um, when I became a master gardener in 2008, I was still learning a lot. And Carol has been um, such a mentor to me in, in teaching me a lot about vegetable gardening. Um, so thank you, Carol. Um, <clears throat> okay, so season extending techniques. Um, as Carol said, you know, we have a mild winter climate here. <clears throat> so a lot of cool season crops will grow here throughout the winter. Um, we generally don't get uh, freezes. We, we don't even often get frosts. 
So a lot of things will grow over the winter. The limiters, as Carol said, is sunlight, hours of sunlight that you get. And as the days shorten, not only are there fewer hours of sunlight in the day, but the sun angle is much lower in the winter. So your vegetable beds are much more likely to be shaded by trees or houses or fences or something like that. Um, for example, where in my backyard, my neighbor has some tall redwood trees to my south. And so for about a month or so on either side of the winter solstice, which is December 21st, I just don't get enough sunlight. Um, so sunlight is, is the limiter in the winter. Now the other limiter that you, you need to understand is temperatures for seed germination. So we have a document posted on um, this event's webpage and it, um, it comes from UC and it's seed, how long seeds take to germinate at different temperatures. <clears throat> so first of all, you need to know what your soil temperature is. A great investment that you can make is a soil thermometer. It um, costs you about five to ten dollars and it's a little analog dial on a metal prong um, that's a few inches long and you just stick it down a few inches to, into your soil and it tells you the temperature of your soil. <clears throat> and that, um, in one of the later slides, uh, you'll get a little bit of a picture of a soil thermometer stuck in, in my raised bed. Um, that's important to know. So if I go out there right now and take the temperature of, of my raised beds, you know, it seems to be down in, you know, like 50 degrees or the low 50s. So you think about it in the daytime, it's getting up to 60, maybe. At nighttime, it's, you know, getting down to the low 40s. So, you know, that soil is just not warming up very much. So let's just say 50 degrees right now. And if you look down that calendar, uh, that, that list there, um, you can see, let's say snap beans. If I plant snap beans in the bed right now, um, <laughs> they're just not going to germinate. Okay. And, you know, that's why if you look at Carol's calendar, um, it tells you don't plant snap beans <laughs> in, in early February or mid February, right? <clears throat> but if I go down to lettuce, if you look at lettuce, you know, lettuce will germinate in about a week, even in a 50 degree bed. So I could plant lettuce now outside. Um, and, you know, if you look at, you know, some of the other things on here, um, you know, let's look at, um, you know, say cauliflower, right? Um, if I plant cauliflower now directly seeded in the soil, on average, it's going to take 19 days to germinate. And my germination rate may be not great. But, you know, if I wait until the soil temperature heats up into the 60s, it's a much shorter germination time. So a lot of what season extending techniques are all about is can I warm up my soil earlier in the season so that I can get crops in the bed sooner? Or can I, you know, start my seeds indoors where you can have your soil nice and warm and then transplant them outdoors, okay? So when we talk about season extending techniques, it's really about ways to keep your bed warmer, um, primarily for seed germination, but also for growing, right? You know, um, Carol showed strawberries 
from <laughs> the demonstration garden picked in January. Um, I can tell you, I've never picked a, a strawberry in January that I grow outdoors. Um, so you can both increase the soil temperature for germination and you can increase the temperature for growing certain crops that like a warmer temperature. Okay, so with that introduction, let's go look at some examples. There's, um, if, if you wanna get into this topic in, in more detail, there's a farmer in Maine by the name of Elliot Coleman. That's mm. with one L. You can look him up. He's written several books, year round gardening, four seasons gardening, and he has shown how he can grow crops um, year round. In fact, his, his farm is called Four Season Farm. Um, so he's in Maine, right? You know, my son happens to be in Maine right now, and I happen to know he's ice skating today. So <laughs> the temperature in Maine is like 25, and Elliot's growing vegetables. So there's a lot of techniques in that book on, on how to extend your growing season, in his case, all year round. Um, there was also an excellent article in the New York Times that I spotted on February 7th um, that was based on a woman who writes about season extending techniques and she gardens in Nova Scotia, okay? So, it can be done, folks. <laughs> we, you know, compared to Nova Scotia or Maine, we're we're in the banana belt here. So, season extending techniques. Uh, the first one is is sort of the, you know, the the most elegant and best way to do it, but it's going to put you out a lot of money, and that's a greenhouse. So, if you look in the background of this photo, sort of at the top over to the left, slightly to the left-hand side, there's a greenhouse back there, okay? And that's, you know, obviously the best way that you can increase your temperature. Um, you know, it's all plastic sided, it captures the, um, the, the energy from the sun and, and, and heats up. Now, a, a greenhouse, first of all, you need space for it. Not all of us have that. Um, and secondly, you need time and money. Um, you know, you can build it yourself. It's still going to cost you a few hundred dollars worth of materials. Um, there are kits available you can buy and, and sort of assemble quickly. But again, those things are going to cost you in the high hundreds, even in the thousands. So a greenhouse is wonderful if you can do it, um, but it's not something that all of us have the ability to do. So that's, you know, that's the top <laughs> option. Let's, let's go to the next option. This is something called a cold frame. And you can see it's basically like a scaled down greenhouse, right? It's, 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 a, it's a frame on the bottom. Um, it's, it's got covered in plastic on, on the top. Um, and you have to make sure you can open it. <laughs> Um, so it's hinged at the back. Um, and you could build cold frames that are kind of their own space, or you could build cold frames that sit on top of, of your raised beds. So you're, you don't need extra soil, you're using the soil that's in your raised bed, and you just place the cold frame on top for this insulating effect. Um, and, it, you know, if you look at this, you can see it's going to cost you a lot less than building a greenhouse, okay? So the, the next step down from the, the greenhouse is, is, the, um, is the cold frame, okay? And a cold frame is often used uh, as a way to germinate seeds in, in the spring because that plastic on top um, is going to give you, um, you know, a good several degrees of warming if, if you're in direct sunlight. Okay, but it, it's important with, with all these things um, that I talk about, greenhouses, cold frames, and the, and the next item, which is floating row cover, 
um, you have to make sure that you can open them, uh, first of all, for access, but secondly, to prevent them from getting too hot um, if you're using them in, in the summertime. So, because those things can get, get way too hot. Okay, um, let's, go, let's go ahead and let's talk about floating row covers. And everything I learned about floating row covers, I owe to Carol O'Donnell. Um, I'm a huge fan of floating row covers because they do a couple of things for you. One is they can do, um, they ha can create extra warmth in, in your vegetable bed. Um, and then the other thing they can do is pest management because they provide a cover over, over the bed that's going to keep squirrels out, which are, you know, the bane of my existence, and flying insects and whatever you might have. So they're wonderful in that they serve a double purpose. What are floating row covers? It's a it's a woven synthetic material. Um, it's white in color. There are different uh, grades of this. Um, so some are thicker and heavier, some, some are lighter. The most common brand of floating row cover is something called Agribon, A-G-R-I-B-O-N. And there are different, like I said, different grades of um, row covers. So um, Agribon 15 is the lightest weight. And so it's the, the most loosely woven. That is not gonna give you a lot of extra heat in your bed, maybe a degree or two. Um, and, and it's important to understand it lets in, Agribon 15 lets in over 90% of the sunlight. Mm -hmm. So you're not preventing the sunlight from getting through to your vegetables. And that's really important. Um, it also lets water through because of the, the way it's woven. Um, you know, if you get a rainstorm, it's going to pool up a little bit, but it also, you know, drips through. And so the moisture does come through. Now, Agribon 15, as I said, is the lighter weight. There's a heavier weight, Agribon 19. So, you know, if you look at what Elliot Coleman's doing or, you know, other people in the Northeast, they're using the heavier weight of Agribon because that's going to give you a good four to five degrees of additional warmth inside that bed. Um, it's going to let in a little less sunlight. I think it's like 85% mm -hmm. for Agribon 19, but that's still pretty good. And again, it will let the moisture through. So floating row covers are a wonderful thing. Um, I use them extensively. And you can see the, all these photos are from the um, Garden Education Center, um, and they use them extensively there. So um, now, how do you uh, how do you you know do floating row covers? So um, first of all, you uh, need to get the right size for your bed. You can buy Agribon in these you know very very long sheets, okay? And typically it comes in a width of um, Carol. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, Twelve feet. The width mm -hmm. of of a roll. Twelve feet in length or width? Width. Okay, and, and so that's going to be more than enough for a four foot wide bed, mm -hmm. draping it in this um, semicircular shape. And we'll talk about how you, how you get that. Okay, so you just, you get it in the standard width generally, and then you just cut it, um, cut it to length, what it, whatever you need for your bed. Um, so what you, what you want to do is you, you create these hoops. Um, and when these things are really, really big, like what Elliot Coleman does, they're called hoop houses. Um, mm -hmm. And those are things that, you know, you can walk through. We're not talking about that. We're talking about something that's just high enough um, to cover your bed and leave ro enough room for the vegetables. Um, so there are different ways to create the hoops. The simplest 
um, which you'll see in a later photo of my garden, is to use number nine steel gauge wire from, um, you go to the hardware store, they cut it to length for you. And uh, you can also cut it with a wire cutter if you have that at home. And basically a 10 foot length of that wire or anything that you're gonna use for your hoop is enough to span a four foot bed stuck into the soil on either side and about a yard above your soil at the top of, of the circle. So you put those things in, in the soil and um, let's go on to the next slide. So number nine steel gauge wire is one way to do it. That's probably the, the lowest tech way to do it. You can bend mm -hmm. that wire very easily. The next step up is this. This is lightweight half inch PVC pipe, which is bendable. Okay, so you get that cut in 10 foot sections and again, stick it in. You can see it's inserted just inside the rim of the bed on, on either side that keeps it in place and it's down probably a good six inches in, into the soil. So that's, you know, next up. And then the next one, this is, um, oh no, I'm sorry. This is the number nine steel gauge wire. Um, maybe go back to the first one. I think that was the electrical conduit. So, so um, the, the, the sort of most sophisticated and probably most expensive way to do it is to buy electrical conduit, which is bendable as well. And again, you just cut it in, you get it into 10 foot lengths and, and put them in your beds. So that done, so go on to the next slide, I think. Um, yeah, so then you drape your, um, you, you drape your Agrabon over it. Um, you need a way to fasten it on the sides and the ends um, to, to do a couple of things. One is to prevent critters from getting in and the other is to prevent it from blowing away when it's windy. Um, I'm fairly low tech. I use like stones and stuff <laughs> to, to fasten it down at the corners. And I'll, I'll take extra, you know, eight foot stakes that I have and just put them on the sides um, to keep it down. And then you, you want to um, have a way to attach it to the tops of the hoop. So if you back up to the first one, I think, um, yeah, oh, next, go forward. Yeah, that one. Okay, so you can see how, how that's um, bunched up. At the top, there are clips there. Uh, maybe keep going, see if there's, there's another photo. There are clips you can buy to attach it to, to the conduit or, or the PVC pipe. If you're using number nine steel gauge wire, which is thinner, I just um, use clothespins, <laughs> which <laughs> work too. great to attach um, the, the Agrabon. Now, obviously there are some limits to what you can do with floating row covers. One is you need to be able to lift it up uh, to do anything, right? Um, to plant, to harvest, to thin, whatever. That's a little bit of an annoyance. Um, another annoyance is when you look out at your lovely vegetable bed, you just see the floating row cover. <laughs> you don't see your lovely vegetables, okay? Um, obviously, it's not going to work for a tall plant. Um, you know, once your pole beans or your tomatoes or cucumbers or anything gets, you know, above a few, three feet high, you can't keep it under a floating row cover anymore. And then the other thing to think about is pollination, right? Because if you've got plants like cucurbits, zucchinis, cucumbers, um, et cetera, that need pollinators because they've got a male and a female flower, the pollinators can't get in if you're under a floating row cover. So it, when those plants start flowering, if you got them under floating row covers, you got to take them off. And then the other thing to think about is you don't, it, 
if if it's a summer day and it's a warm day, mm -hmm. um, it can get kind of warm under these floating row covers and you might want to take it off. Okay, so uh, go ahead to the next one. So yeah, this is this is again from the Garden Education Center. You can see two greenhouses in the back. Um, but th this is something I do as well at home. Um, when I plant directly in the soil, I will lay floating row cover just flat on, mm -hmm. on the top of the bed. And that does a couple of things. One, it, again, will give you a little bit of added warmth in the soil. Um, the other is it's going to keep birds and squirrels and all sorts of pesky critters from digging up your seeds. And you'll know when the seeds have germinated. So first of all, you need to pull it back occasionally to just check the moisture of the soil. Um, and then you will see when the plants start to germinate because they'll start pushing up the floating row cover. And that's the time at which you want to then put your hoops in place and, and raise the floating row cover. Okay, go ahead. Now, um, a common thing that gardeners will do to extend the season is to start seeds indoors, okay? Um, so for example, your warm season crops, you know, by this I'm talking about cucumbers, squash, tomatoes, etc. Um, you're not going to put those out in the garden until April or May, according to Carol's calendar. Um, but you can get a start, jump on the season by starting them now and then transplanting them out there in, in a couple of months. So how do you do that? Well, um, you, you get a tray like the, like the one on the left. Um, you can fill that tray directly with soil, or um, what I do is I save my four inch pots every year and I fill them with soil and just put them inside the tray. Now, those pots have holes in the bottom um, so they can, they can absorb water from the bottom and you're gonna water from the bottom in that case. You just pour water in the bottom of the tray and they will, um, draw the moisture up. Um, you would be better off using something called planting mix rather than potting soil. So planting mix is specifically formulated for germinating seeds. Um, so I would recommend that. And what you see on the right is um, a cover. So you need to while your seeds are germinating, you need to cover that thing to keep the atmosphere moist in there. Okay, um, I just use a I just use plastic, um, or you can use a plastic box, as in this case. So um, then we go to the next slide. Um, those are some tools on the left that you use for planting. On the right is a heating mat. So I, I use these, um, you put it under the tray, you plug it in and you can heat up your soil, you know, higher than the ambient temperature of your house. And if you look at that seed germination chart that we showed at the beginning, um, that's gonna give you a boost in, in germination time. So um, you, you put this on a counter somewhere um, once the seeds have germinated, then you take the plastic top off because they don't need that, that moist, moist environment anymore. What they do need then is light, okay? Because they're going to start photosynthesizing and they need light to grow. So you can either put them in a place where you get, you know, good daylight exposure. Um, what I do is I have them under a uh, couple of fluorescent bulbs. And um, plants like light that is in either end of the visible spectrum. So they absorb the light from the red end and they absorb the light from the blue end. 
and that's why they sh they look green because they're reflecting back the light in the middle in the, in the green range. So if you're buying fluorescent bulbs, um, some of them are what they or what are called cool, and those are bluer. Some of them are warm or called warm, and those are redder. So I actually have you know one cool light and one warm light hanging over this counter. And, and that's where I, I germinate um, my, uh, my, my seeds. So I'm going to be starting this probably this weekend um, in, inside my house. And then depending on the plant, they'll be ready for transplanting in you know, anywhere from four to eight weeks. So this is, this is a great season extending um, technique to start indoors. You know, obviously you need space, you need a few materials, um, um, but, but that's about it. So I think that's the end of my segment. And oh yeah, so, oh yeah, irrigation. Um, we don't really have, have time to talk about irrigation here. We do entire classes on irrigation. It's a really complicated topic. Um, so just a few words on irrigation. Look at the document we have posted for this event um, called um, something about irrigation for vegetables um, that sort of explains the math and um, how much you want to water your vegetables. And there are a lot of variables involved in that. Um, if you're building raised beds or you're going to garden somewhere, make sure you have water nearby, OK? We have a Mediterranean climate. It doesn't rain from you know, May to November, generally. So you need to be able to irrigate. Um, you know, the simplest thing is to take a hose with a sprayer and, and just irrigate that way. That has a couple of drawbacks to it. One is if you go out there on a hot summer day and you're irrigating from a hose with a sprayer, you would be astounded at how much of that stuff is evaporating and going straight up. Okay, so you're first of all wasting water. Secondly, for a lot of vegetables and tomatoes in specifically, um, they don't like having their leaves wet and it, it creates an environment that's conducive to fungal diseases. And so getting the the tomatoes wet from the top is just not a good idea. So, you know, if you go look at Master Gardener Gardens, we've all got drip irrigation, um, which you can see in the in this photo. Um, it, it it basically delivers the water directly to the soil, so you don't get the leaves wet. Uh, if you put it on a timer, then you can have it delivered at you know five o'clock in the morning before there's a lot of evaporation going on. You can control the amount of water um, and, and, and things like that. So drip irrigation uh, is, you know, kind of the, the best way to go for irrigation. It's definitely work. Um, they break all the time, <laughs> um, but it, it's, it's a much better way to go. So that's it, and now we're we're ready to go to Q and A. Can we advance the slides, please? Great. So right now we're going to go ahead and do a little Q and A session. We have about twenty or fifteen minutes that we can do this. I first want to plug this slide here because we have a really wonderful helpline that can answer your questions. So. If we don't get to your question today, I highly suggest you either call or email our helpline. That information is right here. This will also be emailed to you. We have this uh, helpline staffed about three times a week with Master Gardeners. They're literally waiting for you to just send in their questions. They will research your questions and they will email you back. It's a really great resource and we hope you use it for all of your gardening needs, not just vegetable planting or this session, anything you need gardening. With that said, let's go ahead and get to some questions. So uh, the first question we have here, which is a really great one is from Renee. And she asked, is there a recommended bed size for this uh, type of year round plan? This would be for Carol. No, I would use uh, whatever bed size works for you. 
if you can't, I like a five foot bed size, but it doesn't work for me because it's too wide. I can't reach the center of the bed. Um, I standard is four feet, which is good, but I have to run around the other side of the bed. I like two and a half feet, 30 inches. And that's what Elliot Coleman uses on his farm. Um, but it is a waste of uh, limited garden space. Uh, we have another really great question for Renee that I know we talk about internally, which is what do we need to do your, uh, to keep your round beds? They assure they don't have uh, depleted nutrients. And she's especially thinking of tomatoes. Is the alfalfa meal and the compost treatment sufficient? So this is a kind of a crop rotation question, I think. So I'm so grateful you asked that question because I forgot a section of my presentation in which I talked about um, once every two years, I have a soil test done and I usually do it in September. I don't know why, but the labs say that's a good time. And so I get my soil tested in September and then I apply the recommendations uh, as my beds become available once a year, only once a year. So I don't do um, the alfalfa meal and compost. I, do the I follow the recommendations of the lab. And you can use that lab test for two years. Then you need to get a good, another lab test. Don't apply the same recommendations for three years. So the uh, Master Gardener website has a list of um, labs that you can use on our website. And so the next question is from Kim, and she would like to know, what if you live in an area with strong winds off the baylands? Does that affect the planting calendar? What, some wind? I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear. No, no, that's fine. She asked, uh, what if you live in an area with strong winds off the baylands? Does that affect the planting calendar? Oh, well, not the calendar, but the plants, they will grow but not as well as if you uh, protect them. So down at the Garden Education Center, we get a terrific wind at three o'clock in the afternoon. So we've put up um, screening on the windward side of the garden. And you can do that in your garden too. Um, a, a two foot high uh, screen will, I forget how far it protects, but something like 10 feet. So um, put a screen on the windward side of the garden. It will increase your um, growth and, um, and production of your plants. Um, I'm not terribly familiar with the coast, but I understand there's a problem with um, salty air. <laughs> um, so that, that could be a problem. But it, the plants will grow, but it will affect their growth. Jonathan, have you got any ideas on that? No, no, no I, I think that pretty much covers it, Carol. Um, yeah. Great, this is next questions for you, Jonathan, anyhow, which is, would a kitchen thermometer work? <laughs> no, so I just replied to that in the chat window, definitely not. <laughs> and honestly, just buy a soil thermometer, it's cheap. Great. <laughs> Um, and this would probably be either one of you. Are there any shade specific garden bed calendars or resources? Say that again for me. Shade specific, Carol. We're looking for resources for shade specific gardening. Do you know of any shade specific garden bed calendars or resources? Yes, Golden Gate Gardening. <laughs> that is your best resource. That's our Bible. Um, the next one is the Master Gardener Handbook. Um, and for year-round gardening, I noted at the bottom of um, one document, uh, I use um, the 90-Minute Gardener. You'll see it at the bottom of one of my documents. Those are all helpful. And the web provides a lot of information, although prefer a university site rather than just <laughs> the web, you know. 
research, you want a research-based answer. Um, yeah, so, you know, in general, <clears throat> your warm season crops, you know, tomatoes, cucumbers, beans, eggplants, peppers, all those things, they need eight or more hours of sunlight mm -hmm. in, in, in the summer. So they've got to be in your sunniest spot. I have one of my beds that over the years has become more and more shaded. Mm -hmm. So that's my greens bed. I, you know, I just, I can't grow warm season crops. I can grow my Swiss chard in, in there, my, my lettuce, my kale, etc. So those, you know, what, you know, what you call cool season vegetables, they need more like six plus hours. Um, so if you have a shaded spot, you're probably gonna veer more towards the cool, cool season vegetables and the greens. Great. The next question is a really good one from Claire. How are planting mix and potting soil different? Jonathan, I'll defer to you. I was gonna to defer to you actually. <laughs> um, I, I don't know the answer to that, like, you know, from actual ingredients and, and, and so forth, but if it's called planting mix, it, it's, you know, more specifically, um, more specifically tuned for seed germination. I think it's a little less dense um, for one thing. Um, so, but beyond that, I, I couldn't tell you, but if you do go to a garden store and ask for planting mix versus potting soil, they will have it. You'll probably pay oh, more for I it. For, <laughs> I forgot the difference. It, one of the major differences is how fine it is. So if you use potting mix, there are big chunks in there. Right. Yeah. That's the problem with potting mix. Yes. And so, and so planting mix is, is just easier for the seeds to poke through mm -hmm. when they germinate. Great. The next question is from Jacqueline and she would like to know if you plant seeds outdoors in the soil, how do you keep weeds from growing as well? <laughs> you pick them. <laughs> yeah. uh, another way you can do it is um, create a stale bed. And a stale bed means like after I, I weeded my garden and I amended it, then I cultivate it uh, a week from that date and you know keep watering it to get the weeds up and do a couple of of rounds of that so we water weed and then wait a week and weed again and that creates a stale bed it it really um works very well and you sh i don't always do it <laughs> but i recommend um weekly cultivating because I don't carry um, mulch through the house. <laughs> I have to carry everything through the house to get to the garden. So I do have to cultivate instead of mulch. So yeah, so um, mulching is a, is a great topic. I'm glad you brought it up, Carol. I forgot to mention it with irrigation. Um, Mulching is really important um, because first of all, it, um, it will prevent weed germination and mm -hmm. growth um, by blocking the light from, from getting in there. But it, almost more importantly, it reduces the evaporation of, of mm -hmm. moisture from the soil into the air. And I think it can be like as much as 50%. Yeah. So you really reduce your irrigation needs if, um, if you mulch. Now, you don't mulch right away. Let's say you just planted seeds. You don't, you don't put the mulch on right away. You, you wait until the plants germinate and get a few inches high before you have the ability to go out there and mulch in between them. Mm -hmm. Great, and since we're on the topic of irrigation, we're gonna just close out with this being our last question. Again, if your question didn't get answered or you have any other gardening question in your day, anything that has to do with anything gardening, 
please go ahead and email the Master Gardeners. They will answer your questions and they will research it and get you a science-based answer. Um, so our last question is gonna be from Beverly and she would like to know more information about irrigation. Should she use emitters, soakers or something else? Yeah, so, you know, I'll let Carol talk to this one too. I've used both. They all break <laughs> frequently. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, both, both can work. You know, I would really suggest if you're at the point where you're um, building a bed, let's say, or planning to put in irrigation, um, you know, the, we give classes on irrigation and we have people who are like professional irrigation specialists. Um, it's a complicated topic and there's a lot of work and I would encourage you to, um, you know, to, to attend one of those classes. You can, there's also, I'm sure, plenty of online videos. Um, Uh-oh, Jonathan's fading. Uh, let me add to that. I do like soaker hoses and I use them in my um, decorative garden. Um, the ones that I bought are round and um, uh, like a garden hose and they're made out of tires, I think, but they can leach um, cadmium, I hear. Uh, so I, once I heard that, I, I eliminate them from my edible garden. You can buy soaker hoses that are flat, and they use them a lot in agricultural areas, and those do work too. Yeah, so those are, so I use, I don't use soaker hose, I use drip lines, yeah. um, which are, you know, they're, they're hoses and then every six inches they have a hole punched mm -hmm. in them so the water the water drips out um one of the nice things about using that or emitters is that you know how you, each either one of those will tell you what the rate of mm -hmm. of water coming out is and it's expressed in gph gallons per hour and so for a typical one for a drip line is 0 0.5 gallons per hour um, per hole. And so if you're trying to calculate how much irrigation you need to do and how long you need to run your timers for, you can actually do the math by counting up how many holes you have um, throughout your bed or how many emitters, whether they're half a gallon or one gallon per hour. Um, you do the math and it tells you how much water is going onto your soil per hour. And then you can go from there to figure out how long you have to irrigate. Um, but I, you know, irrigation is, is, is complicated um, mm -hmm. and, and a fair amount of work. Um, so definitely get some good instruction on, on how to do it. <clears throat> but Jonathan's paper that you can download from this presentation is the best one I've read on, <laughs> on calculating uh, the amount of water that goes on your bed. Jonathan, that's the best paper I've ever read. Do download that. Yeah, so I'm the resident math nerd of the Master Gardeners. That's, that's, that's my job. All right, thank you so much. We'd like to thank everybody for attending these, uh, our first spring edible series. And the second one is going to be on uh, February the 26th. Uh, and it's going to be entitled Growing Tomato Seedlings and Other Warm Weather Crops. We really want to thank Carol and Jonathan. They did such an excellent job. I know I've been following the planting calendars uh, for a few years and I've had a successful garden. Um, a copy of the presentation and a video will uh, be found on our UC Master Gardeners of San Mateo and San uh, Francisco counties um, within at least within a week. Give us a, a, about a week to post those up. So we want to thank you all. Thank you, Carol and Jonathan, and thank you for all of the tech support that we've had today. And thank everyone for attending. Have a great weekend.